Now, uh, having, uh, having said those items of introduction to myself, uh, what, what do we hope to understand, for example, out of this course? Take a look at this chart. Uh, Cisco Systems Effective Tax Rate. Now, Cisco, I think, probably most of you know, is a major U.S. company. They manufacture equipment for the internet and for other purposes as well. And over a period from 1997 through the current year, their effective tax rate on their worldwide operations, U.S. foreign, all of their operations, their effective tax rate has gone from roughly 40% down to below 20%. Now, you might scratch your head and say, gee, how could that be? Doesn't the United States have a 35% residual tax rate? Now, when I say residual, why am I saying residual? Any ideas? Now, Cisco might have a foreign subsidiary. And let's say that that foreign subsidiary earns a lot of money. Maybe dollars, maybe euros, maybe uh, yen. Isn't that going to be taxed in the United States at the corporate level at a 35% rate or whatever point when Cisco says, gee, I need some money and I'm going to ask the foreign subsidiary, the board of directors that is, to declare a dividend so that the money will come up. And at that point, isn't there an application of U.S. tax? In other words, under normal circumstances, there's no tax within the foreign subsidiary when the income is earned, subject to subpart F, subject to other things that we'll get into, but under normal circumstances, it's not tax. But when a dividend is paid, ultimately there will be a 35% tax paid. So how, how can we have the situation of a less than 35% tax rate. Any ideas? Well, that's, that's a good, uh, good comment. Okay, foreign tax credits. Let's go back to our, our picture. It's a very good answer. But let's assume that the foreign subsidiary has income of 100, let's say it's taxed 20, and there's 80 left over. Okay, there's already been, let's say, a 20% tax. And again, we're going to get into detail on these things later. But when that 80 is paid as a dividend, at that point, we're going to say there's a dividend of 80, there's a deemed paid tax gross up of 20, which gives us 100. We're going to apply a 35% rate or whatever rate is applicable in the year of the dividend. We're going to then take a 20 foreign tax credit and we're going to pay 15 more to the U.S. government. So if this, we're talking about financial statement income. We're not talking, in a sense, when we look at this chart, we're not looking at taxable income. We're looking at financial statement income and the taxes which are allowed as an expense against or let's say the taxes which are 
taken as an expense in coming down to a net income, which then gives you your earnings per share, which drives the stock price. Well, if we look back at our calculation, we have to say that someday on that hundred of income, someday there's going to be a total tax of 35. There was 20 today, and at some time in the future, there will be another 15. So how can they show that under 20% rate? Uh, yes? Could they structure, structure something in between the sub and Cisco where the dividends pass through treaty countries that may perhaps lower? Uh, that's, a, that's a good thought, but when the dividend eventually gets back, even though it goes through five different companies in between, when the dividend finally gets back inside the parent, there will be that calculation and you will you know, end up with some amount of additional tax over what foreign tax has been paid at the subsidiary level. Is it because the, the money hasn't been repatriated yet? Not yet, and? And so um, the effective tax rate is lower because the money is just sitting in low-tax countries. OK, uh, uh, you're, you're going in the right direction. The point is this. When financial statements are done, now again, gee, this is a class in the law school. We're not supposed to know about accounting matters, are we? But the point is, this is damned important to outbound international taxation. Why? Because the mentality of your client is, hey, if I can reduce my effective tax rate, my earnings per share is higher. My stock price is higher. The compensation arrangement under which I get stock options or bonuses or whatever it is ends up being higher if I can achieve a lower a lower uh, effective tax rate. So now we get into an accounting rule. Well, the accounting rule is that under normal circumstances that 15 of extra tax, even though not paid today, even though it's going to be paid at some point, we don't know when, but it's going to be paid someday, the normal rule is that has to be accrued. And that's the normal rule. So if Cisco were following the normal rule, then you would find that 20, uh, I'm sorry, that 35% rate, or even higher because of maybe some state and local taxes in the United States. Maybe they operate in some countries that have very high effective tax rates. So the normal rule is you do have to uh, accrue for this future tax which you don't know when you're going to pay it, but it's going to be there. Well, what if there's a special rule that says, well, management says, gee, we don't think we're ever going to repatriate that money. Well, the accounting rules say that if management, uh, let's say, creditably credibly says that uh, we're never going to repatriate that, well, gee, you don't have to, you don't have to accrue that 15. And if you don't have to accrue that 15, <clears throat> all of a sudden your company-wide effective tax rate goes down. And your earnings per share goes up and your stock price goes up and your compensation goes up. So effective tax rate 
is very, very important. Now, I don't know whether you know any of you have been following, uh, let's say, following financial news uh, of late, but there's been a lot of, let's say, uh, negative press toward Google because they have very wisely done exactly this. And again, what we'll talk about as we are going through these various subject items is we'll see how did they do it. Well, how they did it is kind of important to us because, gee, uh, you know, we're hoping to get jobs with the law firms or accounting firms or with the companies themselves that are doing these things. So, you know, that's something that perhaps is of interest to us. Is there something socially wrong with a tax system that encourages this? And then uh, there's various articles, and again, I've, uh, I've included uh, articles like this on the, uh, the website, the course website. Is there something wrong with a society which creates a system which, frankly, is absolutely fascinating to work in? It's the biggest mental challenge you could ever find, a new jigsaw puzzle every day. It's absolutely wonderful to work in. But is there something wrong that the system encourages companies, encourages professionals to do this, and then, of course, the press criticizes them for being successful at it? Gee, Google is a bad guy. They, uh, they're setting things up, and they save $3 billion of tax, which, because they never plan to bring the money home, they're not putting into their financial statements. They're saying we're never going to pay that. Yes, Peter. So what happens when um, the U.S. gives some kind of temporary tax break for companies to repatriate funds? I mean, if they've already decided to keep them abroad, can they decide? Can they then decide to change their minds and bring them back because it's new law? I and mean, what happens with that accounting? Funny, you should uh, you should uh, ask that. Uh, I, Gee, uh, what happens in the tax area when you have a change of facts? Well, gee, if the fact changes, well, you have to go back to the law and say, well, how, does, how do we now apply the law to that new set of facts? Well, it's the same thing with accounting rules. Gee, we've decided to bring this money home. So now at that point, they will have to accrue the additional taxes that uh, accrue the additional taxes that they did not. In other words, they'll have to accrue that 15. But the point is they'll never do that as long as it's going to cost them that 15. But what happened, uh, you know, like five years ago, five, six years ago? What happened? Anybody know what happened five or six years ago? Yeah, there was a big giveaway. <laughs> Bring all your money home, create jobs in the United States, and we will, instead of taxing it, at, you know, instead of collecting that 15, or what was really more the case, instead of collecting 35, because they had uh, a lot of money maybe in a Singapore company that had a tax holiday and had zero taxes against it, uh, or you know some very much smaller amount, they bring the money back and the the uh, uh, the carrot, so to speak, uh, to encourage them to do it, it was a 5.25 percent tax rate. So what happened? A lot of companies brought money back. The drug industry was one of the principal ones that benefited from this. Do all your research in the United States, and again, we'll get into this more later on, but do all your research in the United States, but make sure that a foreign company somewhere, uh, you know, where it's not going to be taxed, owns the resulting intellectual property. 
Well, you know, somebody is using a, uh, you know, I mean, all of you are using computers here. What's the value? In the plastic or in the intellectual property that allows it to be created? Well, gee, if we're making a, uh, you know, a pill, pharmaceutical product, and we develop the formulation in the United States, but the owner of that formulation is a company overseas somewhere, and then that company starts to manufacture pills and sell it at high prices to customers, whether in the United States or elsewhere, you're building up a lot of low-taxed profits outside the United States. So the drug companies as a group brought back, uh, uh, I think the figure I saw was like $75 billion, uh, or maybe that was the amount of low-taxed income they had overseas. Now, you know, that $75 billion, that's the size of the economy of a small country. Maybe not so small a country. So what's happening today? Has anybody seen uh, a report of, uh, of what uh, one of the, uh, or several of the, I guess, CEOs of major companies have been encouraging uh, President Obama to do? Have a replay. Play it again. Let's have another bring home the money free uh, party. There's the major companies that have all of this money overseas. They're trying to encourage it to happen again. Is that socially right? Is that socially wrong? I, I, won't, uh, you know, I won't comment. But that's the reality. And the reality is that because it was done once, five or six years ago, because it was done once, five or six years ago, it encouraged everybody to be even more aggressive at this sort of tax planning. Because if Congress does it once, they'll do it again. Now, let's, let's go to the next slide now. Now, this one looks slightly more complicated, but uh, I think we can simplify it. Notice that three of the lines, relatively speaking, are flat, and one is going up. And this, again, is Cisco, but it's only focused on the foreign side of the business, not the domestic US side of the business. So amount of assets outside the United States has not changed very much. The sales outside the United States has been flat. The number of employees outside the United States, okay, that's gone up some, but still at least in, from this point has been flat. And the line that goes up is profits that are stated to be attributable to operations outside the United States. So what does this all mean? Well, there's, there's a little bit of a disconnect here. Operation, operationally, things have been relatively flat, but profits have gone up. There's a disconnect. What's happening? <laughs> Notice this is the accumulated, unrepatriated foreign earnings. 
This is that 100 minus the 20 of tax that was left overseas and which management says, gee, I won't bring it back. In the financial statements, companies have to disclose how much income has been uh, left overseas that has not yet, or that, that has not uh, had a, an additional U.S. tax uh, calculated for it on the uh, assumption that it's going to be left overseas. So this information has to be disclosed. And as you can see, since the last, since the last ability to repatriate, which was in that 2004-2005 period, to repatriate at 5.25%, they've obviously been very aggressive in trying to maximize this. Because government does it once, they're going to do it again. Now, again, from the standpoint of our class, this is a major issue of what's happening among the companies that are going to be your clients that you might work for. So understanding how this happens uh, is rather important. We'll get into some of the discussion on this with respect to uh, transfer pricing. How does transfer pricing, in a sense, work that, in ways that allows this to happen? We'll talk about subpart F, which you may or may not uh, have uh, gotten any details on before, which basically is trying to prevent U.S. persons from arbitrarily shifting uh, business profits overseas. Well, the question of what's arbitrary or not arbitrary is uh, is kind of interesting. We'll try to get into that a bit. So, a lot of companies have been very, very successful at this. And the, these charts with Cisco demonstrate that it's not just potentially a small thing, it's potentially a very large thing to the companies involved. This one, I think, is, uh, is really very interesting. Uh, this, you know, why hasn't Congress taxed these foreign pro profits? Uh, I mean, the man in the street says, gee, this is terrible. You know, it costs money to run the government. And this doesn't seem exactly fair that all this income can be earned by US persons effectively and uh, shielded from U.S. tax for uh, forever as a, as a practical matter. So the man on the street would be rather concerned about this. And again, you see it in the press. You see very, uh, in a sense, uh, questioning language uh, about what uh, Google has been uh, accused of recently. Well, interestingly, in 93, Congress actually tried to do something about this. And they passed a, uh, a particular code section. This is part of subpart F, which said uh, that the amount in excess of a certain base would have to be recorded and reported within the shareholder, the U.S. shareholder's uh, tax return and pay tax currently. After three years, they got rid of it. Well, there's the obvious point that uh, it was uh, complicated and uh, burdensome on everybody concerned, no question. But, you know, life is complicated, so I, I tend to discount that. But uh, the principal thing 
that at least uh, Congress latched on to, uh, ignoring, I'm sure, the uh, tremendous amount of lobbying from special interest groups, ignoring that, of course, uh, was the fact that if you justified your need for these low-tax retained funds overseas, well, then you didn't have to report them. So that encouraged everybody and their mother, so to speak, to find things to do overseas rather than here at home. So it operated to be something which encouraged U.S. business to build that new plant overseas instead of, you know, uh, somewhere near rent. So, for various reasons, uh, and again, I'm sure the lobbying had absolutely nothing to do with it, uh, they got rid of it after three years. Now, then, of course, uh, the bottom item is the one that I mentioned about the, uh, uh, the uh, temporary uh, bring the money home and we'll tax it only five and a quarter percent. And very definitely, there's now pressure for another one. 